Hi, welcome to Talking Books and Stuff, the program that talks all about books and writing and stuff. Here's your host, Dennis Rimmer. Hello and welcome back again. Yes, this is another edition of Talking Books and Writing and Stuff. And today's guest on our exciting podcast is a guy named Chet Corey. Now, I've known Chet since oh the late 80s, I guess. We kind of worked together a lot in the 90s in yep. Bellingham, Washington. Mm-hmm. Yep. And haven't seen each other maybe two or three times in 20 years. So, Chet Corey, let's go back to your early life. Born and raised in Bellingham, am I correct there? That is correct. Born in a Bellingham life or never left. Never. Or if I left, it was only for a month or two. <laughs> always came back, just like they all do. But, uh, yeah, I had a love for radio. You know, I always loved when I was a youngster. You might have done this, too. I got my record player out with my 45s and played DJ. <laughs> Kids do that if you want to be in radio. <laughs> now, I probably got my first real to real recorder when I was 12. Remember those little black, and they had tiny, tiny reels. I don't know. You probably got maybe 15 minutes on the tape. And I taped everything I could from family gatherings to local parades to auto racing. And that kind of got me going. And then 30 years later, radio and TV. So, Oh, TV. Okay. Well, we'll talk about that. So your early life in Bellingham, you went to uh, uh, up here, we call it elementary school, and then you had middle school and then high school. So was that at Fairhaven and Seaholm? That is correct, yep. And, and it was actually my ju- my junior year in high school where I actually had my first radio experience at the KAGT in Anacortes. It was 1340 on the AM dial, and they were broadcasting the races from the Skagit Speedway, which is a local auto racing facility in Alger, Washington, about 15 minutes south of Bellingham. And I made some tapes. I took my cassette recorder to the races, made some tapes. And July 14th, 1972, they hired me to help them out on the broadcast. And I wrote filler material, called a few races. And the next season, the anchor left. So I started anchoring the broadcast. And that led to 1974. I got involved with the track management and uh, because... The stockholders thought that our radio broadcast on little KAGT, a little AM, was taking away from the crowd. So they said, no, we don't want you to broadcast anymore, what? which is ridiculous. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they did hire me as a racetrack reporter, so I became a reporter and track publicist and did that about uh, 20 years. And so racing in the summer and then hockey in the winter, uh, if you remember good old KERIFM, when FM was a throwaway, remember those days in the 70s were... If you had an AM FM combo, you buy ads on the AM and they all oh, will give you some ads on, on the FM. So <laughs> we did hockey games. We did hockey games on the FM, believe it or not. And they hired the pride of, I think I'm saying this right, Etonia, Saskatchewan, Elmer Tippy to do the play by play. Oh, and right. he, he was a, remember Elmer? Yeah, he was a disc jockey he, up at CKWX uh, in Vancouver. Yes. CKWX. Yep, and the well-respected country singer. At the, yep. He had raised Harmony 5 and the Pine Mountain Boys. He's won so many broadcasting awards. Anyway, he lived in Maple Ridge. He got tired of driving down to Bellingham and said, you do the game. So I started doing Bellingham Blazer games, and, and I liked Stan Smill and Harold Philippoff and those guys that made it to the NHL, Brad Maxwell. But the highlight for me was the Centennial Cup run uh, for the Blazers, 74-75. They played the uh, Alberta champs. Bruce Grove Mets. Uh, the Blazers won the first two games here and then four straight losses in uh, Spruce Grove. But anyway, I traveled with the team and I did the game back to Bellingham on it. K-E-R-I-F-M. <laughs> um, yeah, my, my color man was Norm Bainter from the Bellingham Herald. He traveled with the team as well. So we shared a room and became pretty good friends. And that arena actually closed um, in the fall of that year. So it was really empty for a year. In 76, 77, the team came back with 95% of the players finished. Right. And uh, we, we did broadcast again, but this time, because they thought they couldn't sell any ads local, every time Langley, Langley, British Columbia, right across the border, the Langley Lords came to Bellingham, we broadcast the game. All the sponsors were from Langley. <laughs> so uh, it, it was, so you really had, you 
you couldn't be a homer toward Bellingham, and you really can't be a homer toward Langley. So you really had to walk the line that time. So that was quite interesting. And Ryan Walter was on that team, you know, became yeah. a heck of an NHL player. And he played but, uh, for the Canucks yeah. and the Canadians and Washington Capitals. Yep. So That's right. So well, the Blazer era finally ended after the 79-80 season. The team folded. And so I got involved with the Western Washington University team, hockey team, which was at a kind of a, a club level. Yep. Under coach John Newtondale. And John was a, a fantastic guy. Hockey fans out in Edmonton in Quebec who are like in the late seventies and eighties. Remember John? He attended UBC and the University of Alberta. John's story is such a great one. I wish he was still around and maybe his wife would be a great guest on your program. He should have been the first black player to play in the NHL. He was the first one to sign an NHL contract. He signed with the Detroit Red Wings in 1955. Jack Adams was the manager. And he played with their farm club, which they had been some flyers. Right. And he played on the line with uh, Willie O'Ree and Stan Maxwell. They even called it the black line at the time. <laughs> and uh, uh, Willie O'Ree actually acknowledge, acknowledges uh, that John should have been the first black player. But the reason John never made it, Mickey Leonard was his girlfriend. She was white. Oh, no. Adams, Adams told him that was a deal breaker. And, of course, we're thinking the mid-50s, so... Yep. He was stuck in Edmonton his entire career. He finally married Mickey in 1959, and they were still together when John passed in 2006. And he was such a great, I wish he was still around. He would have been a great guest for it, too. But he helped stop, start the Bellingham Minor Hockey Association. He was an assistant training coach with the 1980 uh, Miracle on Ice uh, U.S. Olympic team over at Lake Placid. And we were together for almost 80 to 85 uh, the, with the Vikings, and we won, or the team won, three West United States Club Hockey Championships in exotic hockey locations, Dennis, of Burbank, California, and Tucson, Arizona. Oh, wonderful place. Oh, no. <laughs> We're talking with, uh, with Chet Corey, a guy I worked with in the 90s in Bellingham, Washington. Chet's from Bellingham, went to high school. Now, you went to the Western Washington University for a while, did you? Yes, I did, but I did not graduate, and that would come back to haunt me eventually. But yes, I got a job with the, with the Blazer hockey team. They hi I was three years into my degree in broadcasting, and and they wanted to hire me to do PR and and travel the world because the idea was because Bellingham at that time could not go for the Centennial Cup. This is now we're talking 1976, 77, 78. So. When the season ended, even if in one year in 78, 79, Bellingham won the BCJHL championship, but could not go for the Centennial Cup. Some strange thing, reason. Anyway, so our owner promised, okay, every spring we'll take, take a trip to Europe, Germany or someplace and play in some tournament over there. So that's what we did the one year. We won the championship, beat Kamloops, and uh, went on to play in Germany that year. So. Uh, yeah, and then we'd have a training camp every fall in, in Czechoslovakia at the time. It was communist Czechoslovakia. So, yeah, it was supposed to work and uh, draw players to Bellingham because, of course, everybody wants to go for the Centennial Cup, but we thought well, since we couldn't, <laughs> we would trick them into coming to our team so they got all these European trips. But uh, And it was supposed to work out, but it really never did work out. So. And you didn't but, go back and finish your degree, even by correspondence? I never did. Oh, no. I, I Total total failure, total <laughs> failure on that part. <laughs> but, uh, but what? Get you know, I the, the, yeah. I just want to say what it did come back to haunt me was when um, the radio, all the radio stations closed here. At least my station closed and it was sold, which I can address in a minute. But um, <laughs> I applied all over, you know. And there was a job at Western, being a manager of KUGS, which is the uh, university of radio station. Right. And I thought, you know, twenty some thirty years in radio should be worth something. I don't have a degree, but I have all that experience because like, I hired and fired and trained the staff, as you know. Yes. But it wasn't enough. So I was did not get the job. I hired someone, hired someone from Vermont or Maine or some East Coast uh, locale. But, <laughs> so it can't come back to haunt you. But all that being said, uh, I did get a job with the government, which we can talk later, and it, that's been a, a pretty good pretty good deal. <laughs> well, what got you interested in car racing? Because it was like... Um, open wheel cars in a quarter mile dirt track, I think like that's not really a high profile sport. So what got you interested in that? <laughs> well, I started in, I saw my first race at Skagit in 1962. My dad uh, took me down and I just fell in love with the, with the place. And who knows, 10 years later, I 
we started doing them on radio and then we then I became the track publicist so it kind of happened pretty fast I wrote I had three racing columns uh, for those who know racing Chrissy Conamaki famous racing uh, writer uh, did National Speed Sport News I had a column in that paper which was out of New Jersey yeah. Racing Wheels is the paper in Vancouver Washington that covered mostly all in the western states I had a racing column and wrote racing stories that was called Behind the Mic column Whoa. and even a Canadian one called Car Weekly Canadian Auto Racing Weekly which was out of Ontario and I had Chet Chat <laughs> Chet Chat <laughs> and, uh, no, and who in Ontario would care about what happened to Skagit Speedway or Hangin Speedway or Sky whatever Sky Valley Speedway it's right. strange but anyway they liked it and it, I didn't get paid anything but I did submit columns and they printed them and they shipped papers down here and in the day when you could actually physically hold a paper. Right. And, uh, yeah, people bought them, so I guess that was good. But <laughs> so, <laughs> so racing just came from that way, and that, you know, led into kind of doing the hockey. My dad was a hockey fan, and he'd watch Hockey Night in Canada in the day when it would come on at 5.30 our time. It yes. would be 30 minutes into the game. Yes, like like halfway through the first period. People remember that. Yeah, I do, yeah. because mm-hmm. halfway through the first period, we're from the same era, even though I'm slightly right. older than you. And, uh, and one one week would be Toronto, and the next week would be Montreal, and that's why I've been a yeah. life, lifelong Montreal fan. So, And that I grew up a Toronto fan, because I couldn't stand Montreal. Well, so. I can't stand Toronto, yeah. so okay, let's <laughs> next time we meet, let's duke it out, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Drop the mitts, but... Uh, why yeah, do? But I, here's one for you. Just I just to, became a Leaf fan. I, I had a Leaf jersey and I had a hat. And oh my all this god! Stuff, but it was harder to get because you know you can't yeah. get that stuff. No. When I was, I didn't have anything when I was a kid. Um, why do people in Toronto drink out of bottles? I don't know. Because Montreal has all the cups. Uh, ah, ah, ah. That's a heartbreaker. Well, that's well, <laughs> not since '93. But Our, anyway, so. Yeah, I remember '67. Uh, I remember like, my parents let me stay up late to watch the end of the game, and Toronto went three to one. Yep. And I actually have that of that black and white version of that on a VHS tape. <laughs> um, only only reason was because Hockey Night in Canada, I think during one of the NHL strikes, was running uh, highlight games from past years. And I think they had that on, and I taped it. I watched it the other day. So. <laughs> and yeah. Uh... Uh, what was it? Bill well, Hewitt. That, that was the, the year I graduated from high school, just to let you know what our age is. I was 12. <laughs> <laughs> I was 12 and 67. Well, I guess I was 18, so I'm only six years older than you, so that's okay. Yeah, so. Yeah, it's about but, time. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so then you got into. But the whole hot... radio thing, you know. Yep. You know, we were to, you know, you were a news director at uh, APUG when I was at KBSW. And, right. Um, yeah, I started there in 83 as a weekend announcer, went full-time in 84, and then, of course, the station sold in uh, 1999, so, and that's uh, a song of communication, you were, probably remember that, of yep. the yep. pride of Gross Point Farms, Michigan, they purchased all five Bellingham stations, <laughs> and, um, they, and inter- they, oh, sorry. they kept telling me that I'd have a job with the new group, they kept telling me that, oh yeah, you can manage the, the country station, which was going to be K-I-X-T, Kicking country it was supposed to be. Sure. And uh, anyway, two weeks before all the merger, Steve Smith, who owned KBSW, said, "No, they decided they're not going to hire you." So. Oh, jeez. And at that point, it was it was relief because all this not knowing was worse than actually finally knowing one way or the other. Right. And the interesting thing so, about KBFW folks back in the old days, KBFW in Bellingham, uh, nine thirty on your AM dial, was it was in a drive-in theater. So how did, yes. how did that work? Like, you did you just walk in whenever the show was on and, and go to work? Or? <laughs> well, that was, that was because the, the people that owned the station uh, owned uh, SRO, Sterling Recreation Organization, and they owned driving theaters in the West, and they owned many, many radio stations. So, yes, it was a little tricky because, especially when I had the night shift in the summer, we, we were a daytimer there, so we'd sign off at 9.15 p.m., Yep. And then trying to leave, the movie's going, and the kids running around trying to get out of the doggone parking lot without hitting a kid or a body or someone laying on the ground. It was a miracle. <laughs> and and I, they had those spikes spikes in the entryway, so you couldn't come in the wrong way. Yep. Which one time, Miss Watkin County came for an interview at the station. She came in that way, popped all of her tires. <laughs> so the interview did not go very well. <laughs> 
<laughs> when the time I got the interview, she was not a happy camper. But thank God for thank God for AAA. That's, and I remember being there above the drive-in theater, and it always smelled like popcorn. Yes. 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 Oh, I always smell like stale popcorn. Yeah. So you it's, got into Broadway. Well, I mean, one time, I yeah, I worked a Sunday morning shift one time, and someone left a, an old dried pizza for me from the night before. And, you know, we're young and hungry, so I said, I'll put this outside and let it kind of warm up a bit. The door closed behind me, and all my keys are inside. <laughs> so it was a Sunday morning, so we had a religious show running. So I had about a half hour to figure it out. But I went running. There was a restaurant next door. I said, I'll run next door and call somebody, have them come. But luckily, just when I was running down the street, the janitors came. So <laughs> I turned around, and they let me in the building. That was, that was kind of scary. I don't but know. The I, thing, I, yeah, the thing with Saga, uh, you know, they thought that they were going to run the country station just so much better than we did, and they failed. It lasted one year, KIXT disappeared, then it became Progressive Talk, and now it's, uh, I think it's some classic rock, and now it's KBAI, K-Bay. So it kind of tickled me that they, they thought they were going to run it so much better, and it died three different times. We're talking with Chet Corey from Bellingham, Washington, a former co-worker of mine. He's been involved in broadcasting pretty much all his life, also a writer, newspaper columns, ma mainly about car racing, and he also did lots of hockey broadcasting. And I've got to say, Chet, I don't know how you did it, and this is not like, what am I going to get by, you know, pumping your tires, as they say. You're one of the best play-by-play -play guys I've ever ever heard. Like you could have been in the Hen H L, baby. So uh, <laughs> kudos to you. you uh, I don't know how you do it. You you know what the numbers are and the guys who are coming on, and and that's a possible two on one could be, could be a offside. Oh no, he touched up and all this. And I'm beside you, going. How does he know this stuff? What the? How, how, uh, and then I, once in a while, I'd have to do a play-by-play, -play and it was just like hopeless. But uh, I couldn't keep up no, to the I, Chet I Corey stand. The Chet Corey standard I, is is right up there with the top of the world, baby. Top of the world. Well, I appreciate that. But, That's uh, true. Yeah, people keep saying I, I should have been bored on your side of the border. It would have been <laughs> a lot better. Maybe I could have went on and done more. But well, well, it's too late now. I'm an old geezer. What the yeah, heck? Same you with know? me. That's the way it goes. And. <laughs> One more thing, we've got to get this in before we continue. You were also, for two games apparently, a coach of the Bellingham Blazers in the old BCJHL, which is now just the BCHL. You're undefeated, is that right? <laughs> yeah, I wish it had something to do with my skill. <laughs> <laughs> well, Don Perry was our coach in 1980 Olympics. You know, uh, his son Ken was playing for the Canadian team, so he wanted to go back to Lake Placid to watch and miss a couple of games. And and so I, I took over. So, um, yeah, I mean, he, and uh, I know one of the games, he arrived just when, like, in the last seconds of the game. And I, I didn't know he was there, but I heard him whispering because we were leading Langley, like, three to two, and they had pulled their gold, and he was whispering to me what line I should have out there <laughs> for the last 30 seconds. Oh. I, whoever I had out, we, we survived, and we, okay. we still won the game. And well, you always. We, we won a game, and. In Delta, the Delta Suns, when they were in the league and they won a game up there. But, um, <laughs> yeah, it has to do with my skill. I think the guys just tried hard. Well, you got to have two centers out in the last 30 seconds in case one gets tossed out of the face-off circle. That's the only yeah, thing well, I know. I'm, that's probably what he was telling me, and I, I didn't think that far ahead. <laughs> Chet Corey's <laughs> our guest today. Chet, tell me a little bit about your travel. You've done lots of travel, especially uh, Europe, um, Finland, uh, those kind of countries. So did that start with the hockey connection? Yes, because we went, we had that training camp in, in Finland, and then we took so many Finns. We took I had a camp there in Savolina, Finland, which is on the east coast of uh, Finland, and then took the group that we picked to um, Prague, and we had a tour of uh, of uh, Czechoslovakia, and it was common to Czechoslovakia. So I remember flying to the Prague airport, and there's officers with guns in the airport and now that could be our airports right i mean it's like <laughs> we've, we've kind of gone backwards but uh, met some good people that got to be friends with some of the czech players and then we hosted them uh here we sold games to uh the bcjhl so there's like nine games here they went to quinnell and prince george and langley and nanaimo and victoria in the western league and uh they did fairly well 
Um, there were a few incidents that, you know, that were interesting. And then when they got home, they kept writing me, please send goalie pads, please send size 12 skates, please. Oh. Oh. You know, I didn't have that kind of money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but they thought, oh, well, he, he must have some money. But I, I did. I said, well, there was a guy I was trading pins with, hockey pins, and that's a little cheaper to send than hockey skates. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, you make so many friends in hockey, as you know. Right. It's hard to, in racing, auto racing as well, you make friends, and a lot of them are lifetimes. And you also had a collection. Now, do you still have your collection of that dates back years and years of like NHL press guides and that type of thing? You know, I used to have them, and um, I had them. We had so many because I had them from 1968 all the way through probably '92, and I had I stored them at the radio station in my office. Then when the station closed, I said, "Where the hell am I going to put these?" They all were in binders. They're all just perfect, and I had a lot of autographs because we used to go to Canuck games and. That's time you could stand down and put the glass, put them over the glass, and the guys would come by and sign them. It was easy back in those days. But I finally sold them. There was a Christian group in somewhere, I think it was Ontario, they advertised in hockey news that they were raising funds and they would help you sell your collection. So you had to send it back to them and they would keep 10% or something. And I said, well, 10, you know, who cares? Yep. I, I get 80% and they get 10 and that's better than sitting on the shelf. So yep. I don't know, I got two or three thousand dollars for them and um i still have some wha ones and i'm trying to sell all my stuff when you get our age where are you heck are you gonna put all this stuff exactly i don't even know what to do with uh, the stuff i have and it's hardly anything totaling what you had this is chet Corey, by the way on talking books and stuff today we're talking about books and writing and hockey and broadcasting so speaking of which did you write as a youngster, were you always writing, you know, like in elementary school, stories to hand in for composition class, that kind of thing? Yes. Yeah, senior year I won a uh, contest for writing about the flag, about the American flag, and I was the best one in high school. So, And <laughs> that's what piqued my radio interest, too, because I went to a KGMI, and they, they taped them, they were playing them later. And being in that studio by myself and having the script and a microphone, it just kind of lit another fire in me and just got all excited. All excited. He <laughs> did it. He did it for as long as I could, anyway. Yep. But, <laughs> and the rest is history. Some, you know, <laughs> hockey's given us so many memories. I just think one of the most recent ones was in 2018. I went to the Las Vegas uh, Golden Knights home opener. Whoa. And it was one week, one week after the shooting. Oh, boy. And so we spent the day down at the Las Vegas sign looking at all the memorials. And that just I mean, my wife and I were in tears. They had counselors actually down there walking around, and you see people, you, you couldn't help it, but lose it. And when, when my wife loses it, I always lose it. So, <laughs> yeah, I anyway, know. that night, the opening ceremony was just fantastic, and I was just hoping Vegas would score a goal. They were playing Phoenix, I said, or Arizona. Yep. I oh, just score a goal. Anyway, it was 5-2, to two, like after two periods for Vegas. Yeah. At that time, we didn't know how good they would be. Right. Not expecting them to make the Stanley like Cup final their first year. You know, and, and, and I was in Miami, 1996, when the when the Panthers played the uh, Colorado Avalanche when the rat tossing <laughs> in the old Miami arena, which closed in 1988, was demolished in 08. But yeah. I saw Game Three of that series. There's some, yeah, great memories of hockey and, and auto racing. I've been in a few media races for auto racing, and I won one. I have a trophy for winning one race. Oh, but, really? <laughs> um, yeah. What uh, car? Yeah, it was, it's fun. What car did you drive? It was a stock car. Actually, ironically, it was on a stock car on a pavement track, Evergreen Speedway in Monroe. Yep. And uh, and they had a media race. Really, if people don't understand those, it's the hype to get people to come to the race. So you'd have people from Seattle Media, Everett Media, they'd be doing their radio shows and say, hey, come out to Evergreen Speedway. I'm, I'm going to beat Jet Corey. He's from that little station, Bellingham KBSW. And come out and see me, cheer me on. You know, all those kind of things to hype yep. it. And then, of course, little KBSW, Chet Corey, went great against KJR and, and all those big Seattle stations. Like so. <laughs> that, that was fun. That, so, that was a lot of fun. But it's, finally, it's funny, I've never won on dirt. And all, all the years I've been around dirt, I've been in many dirt tracks racing for uh, media, but yep. I finished second and third, but never actually won on the dirt. So, <laughs> so what, do you so, do, what do you do for hobbies these days? Like uh, hockey and racing is kind of off to the side, I guess. So. You know, I've seen most of the hockey games in the last 10 years, believe it or not, I've seen 
are in Florida. And my stepson lives down there in Fort Lauderdale. He has season tickets. And anytime we make a trip down there, I always look at the schedule ahead of time, <laughs> just in case there might be a Panthers home game. And there always seems to be. And uh, and it's t- cheap to get tickets down there. It's, I mean, it's 50 bucks. You can get a real good seat. They're never sold out. So <laughs> of course not. Free parking. Yep. <laughs> so, but my my main hobby is we love, my wife and I love going to live theater. We go to 35, 40 events a year at either Western or the Bellingham Theater Guild, the Mount Baker Theater. We love musicals, you know, any kind of live theater, live music. Sylvia Center for the Arts is good too. So we, we enjoy that. And that's kind of our hobby. And uh, we've had, you know, I, I walked out of the Mount Baker Theater February 26th of 2020. And who would have thought that's the last time I'd be in a theater? <laughs> Here, oh, exactly. we are, Here we six, are, 16 months later. Ugh. I mean, who knew, you know? Who but, knew? Um, yeah, that's where I spend most of my extra dough. Yep. And you've got uh, cats and dogs or a cat lying around the house? I have one cat. What? I have one cat named Mogi. He adopted us. He lived up the street five, five houses up, and he kept coming down and visiting us, and he would never go home. <laughs> and we, this is a strange story. We told the owner, and she finally said, well, he'd rather live here. And he'd rather live here, so oh, he kidding. became our cat. You're kidding. I mean, I can't imagine anyone giving up on their cat so easily. But. No, no, we wouldn't do that. I mean, can you imagine? Yeah. Is your cat going next door, and you, you finally say, oh, well, if he wants to be there. <laughs> they had a cat door problem, and, and she couldn't figure out how to work their cat door, I guess, up there. But now oh. he's been our cat. And it came in handy because we had another cat that passed away about two months after he was here. that we had for 18 years. It was really helped to have him around. To kind of help us get through that. We're talking with Chet Corey. It's pretty much time to wrap it up. Chet's been our guest. He's from Bellingham, Washington. He and I work together. Uh, we all we'll always have. Uh, well, let's see. Um, we had uh, the Jason Derby when we did broadcast for the BCHL. How many teams had Jasons <laughs> on their team back in the early '90s? Everybody, every second kid was called Jason. Uh, let's see. Yeah, hot right. hot dogs and hamburgers. Uh, Vernon had pretty good hot dogs, didn't they? Uh, yeah, they did actually. Yeah, there were some. Yeah, some things you could really actually eat in some of the rinks, but if we had time, if we had time, and uh, you were so well prepared, I don't know how you did it. Like I keep saying, and um, the clock in Merritt, what is that? The Joe Smith Memorial Clock or something? Uh, Pooley. Pooley. Thomas Pooley. Tom. Remember Pooley? P O O L E Y. Something Pooley Memorial Clock. The Memorial Clock. Like that's the greatest thing I've ever heard. It's been one one more. Who's going to win the Stanley Cup in 2022? It's not going to be the Seattle Kraken, that's for sure. You can go to the bank on that. Uh, Good. <laughs> I don't think Tampa can win three. Everybody picks Colorado every year or Vegas. So uh, eventually, if you pick them every year, you're going to luck out eventually. But um, I'm going to say Vegas is finally going to do it. They're going to keep Flurry. And Leonard will be gone, and I think uh, everything will be good. By the time people hear this, though, something it might have changed with that. But I'll go Vegas. Okay, we'll go Vegas, then uh, we'll check back in a year and see how you're doing. And maybe the border will be open by then, and we can actually visit in person. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Chet, Corey, thank you very much for being our entertaining guest here on Talking Books and Writing and Stuff. My pleasure. We could have easily done a part two, but I don't know if anyone cares. <laughs> Right. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for visiting with us today. This is Talking Books and Stuff with Dennis Rimmer. Contact him at dennis at talkingbooks.tk. Thank you, and may all the good news be yours. Oh, and don't forget to check out his book, The Great Canadian Notebook, available across Canada and at Amazon.ca.